The point about human development, and specifically human brain development, is that it occurs mostly under the impact of the environment, and mostly after birth. Now, if you compare us to a horse, uh, which can run on the first day of life, we see that we are very undeveloped. We can't develop, we can't uh, muster that much neurological coordination, balance, muscle strength, visual acuity, until a year and a half, two years. And that's because the brain development that in the horse happens in the safety of the womb, in a human being has to happen after birth. And that has to do with simple evolutionary logic as the head gets larger, which is what makes us into human beings. The burgeoning of the forebrain is what creates the human species, actually. Um, at the same time, we walk on two legs, so our pelvis narrows to accommodate that. So now we have a narrower pelvis, a larger head. Bingo, we have to be born prematurely. And that means that the brain development that in other animals occurs in utero, in us, occurs after birth. And much of that under the impact of the environment. And um, the concept of neural Darwinism simply means that the circuits that get the appropriate input from the environment will develop optimally, and the ones that don't will either not develop optimally or perhaps not at all. If you take a child with perfectly good eyes at birth and you put him in a dark room for five years, he'll be blind thereafter for the rest of his life because the circuits of vision require light waves for their development. And without that, even the rudimentary circuits present and active at birth will atrophy and die, and new ones will not develop. There's a significant way in which early experiences shape adult behavior, and even and especially early experiences for which there's no recall memory. It turns out that there are two kinds of memory. There is explicit memory, which is recall. This is when you can call back facts, details, episodes, circumstances. But the structure in the brain, which is called the hippocampus, which encodes recall memory, it doesn't even begin to develop fully until a year and a half, and it's not fully developed until much later, which is why hardly anybody has any recall memory prior to 18 months. But there's another kind of memory, which is called implicit memory, which is in fact an emotional memory, where the emotional impact and the interpretation that the child makes of those emotional experiences is ingrained in the brain in the form of nerve circuits ready to fire without specific recall. So I'll give you a clear example. People who are adopted have a lifelong sense of rejection very often. They can't recall the adoption. They can't recall the separation of a birth mother, but there's nothing there to recall with. But the emotional memory of separation and rejection is deeply embedded in their brains. Hence, they're much more likely to experience a sense of rejection and a great emotional upset when they perceive themselves as being rejected than other people. That's not unique to people who are adopted, but it's particularly strong in them because of this function of implicit memory. Infants who are born premature are often in incubators and, and various types of gadgetry and machinery for weeks and perhaps months. It's not known that if these children are touched and stroked on the back for just 10 minutes a day, that promotes the brain development. So human touch is essential for development. And in fact, infants who are never picked up will actually die. That's how much of a fundamental need being held is to human beings. In our society, there's an unfortunate tendency to tell parents not to pick up their kids, not to hold them, not to um, uh, pick up babies who are crying for fear of spoiling them, or to, to encourage them to sleep through the night. You don't pick them up, which is just the opposite of what the child needs. And these children might go back to sleep because they give up, and their brains just shut down as a way of defending against the vulnerability of being abandoned, really, by their parents but their implicit memories will be that of a world that doesn't give a damn. A lot of these uh, differences uh, are structured very early in life. Uh, in a way, the, if you like, the parental experience of adversity, how tough life is or how easy it is, is passed on to children whether through maternal depression or parents being bad-tempered with their kids because they've had a hard day or just being too tired at the end of the day. And these have very powerful effects, uh, programming children's development that we know a lot about now. But that early sensitivity isn't just an evolutionary mistake. It exists again in many different species, even seedlings as an early adaptive process to the kind of environment they're growing up in. But for humans, 
the adaptation is to the quality of social relations. And so uh, early life, how nurturing or how much conflict, how much attention you get, um, is a taster of the kind of world you may be growing up in. Are you growing up in a world where you have to fight for what you can get, watch your back, fend for yourself, learn not to trust others? Or are you growing up in a society where you depend on reciprocity, mutuality, cooperation, where empathy is important, where your security depends on good relations with other people? And that needs a, a very different uh, emotional and cognitive development. And that's what the early sensitivity is about. And par parenting is almost, uh, quite unconsciously, a system for passing on that experience to children of the kind of world they're in. The great British child psychiatrist D.W. Winnicott said that fundamentally two things can go wrong in childhood. One is when things happen that shouldn't happen, and then things that should happen but don't. And the first category is the traumatic and abusive and abandonment experiences of my downtown Eastside patients and of many addicts. That's what shouldn't happen but did. But then there is the non-stressed, attuned, non-distracted attention of the parent that every child needs, that very often children don't get. They're not abused, they're not neglected, and, and they're not traumatized. But what should happen, the presence of the emotionally available nurturing parent just is not available to them because of the stresses in our society and the parenting environment. And the psychologist um, Alan Shore calls that proximal abandonment. When the, present, the parent is physically present, but emotionally absent. The Buddha argued uh, um, that everything depends on everything else. He says the one contains the many and the many contains the one. That you can't understand anything in isolation from its environment. The leaf contains the sun, the sky, and the earth, obviously. Uh, this has not been shown to be true, of course, all around, and specifically when it comes to human development, uh, the modern scientific term for it is the biopsychosocial nature of human development, which says that the biology of human beings uh, depends very much on their interaction with the social and psychological environment. And specifically, the psychiatrist and researcher uh, Daniel Siegel at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, has coined a phrase interpersonal neurobiology, which means to say that the way that our nervous system functions depends very much on our personal relationships. In the first place with the parenting caregivers, and in the second place with other important attachment figures in our lives, and in the third place with our entire culture. So that you can't separate the neurological functioning of a human being from the environment in which he or she grew up in and continues to exist in. And uh, this is true throughout the life cycle. It's particularly true when you're dependent and helpless and your brain is developing. But it's true even in adults and even at the end of life.